The purpose of today's activity is to find the spring constant of a particular spring. Now remember, when we're writing a problem, we have to phrase that in the form of a question. So it's going to be more like, what is the spring constant of a particular spring? What's the value of the spring constant? In our last lab, we were trying to find a relationship between two variables. In this lab, we're trying to find a number. We're trying to find the spring constant of a particular spring. We have three sets of variables again manipulated, responding, and control variables. There is one manipulated variable, one responding, and then multiple control variables. There's usually going to be one or two control variables that are critical. That's what you really need to focus on. And then whatever else you list is kind of a bonus. I'm not going to give you those variables right now, but you're going to think about those variables as we're going through the procedure. Hey, what am I changing through this activity? What's changing because of that through this activity? And then what needs to stay the same? What's critical that remains constant through this entire experiment? Your materials are uh, essentially listed for you already in this picture, but let me clarify just a little bit. We have what's called a, a, a Hooke's Law apparatus here. Hooke's Law apparatus consists of a base, it consists of this pole that goes up from it, guys. It consists of this ruler, you can't really see that that's a ruler, but it is a ruler on the back of it. It consists of a hook that kind of goes out here. We will attach a spring, which isn't really part of the Hooke's Law apparatus, but um, we're going to attach that spring to the Hooke's Law apparatus. In addition to the spring and the Hooke's Law apparatus, we're going to have a mass set. So a set of, of uh, brass masses that are going to go on this little tray that hooks onto this spring. Okay, that's essentially what it's, what it's made up of, and that's essentially what your apparatus is going to look like. Now, how do we actually perform this experiment to determine what the value of the spring constant is? Well, the first thing I want you to do, after you've got the basic setup like you see on the board there right now, is to focus in on the spring and the ruler. When you've got the spring hung from the, from the hook up here, okay, you may find that the bottom of the spring does not line up with any particular point on the ruler. You want to adjust the ruler up or down so that the bottom of the spring, it should correspond to zero on the ruler. Mine's not quite perfect there. Okay, you're going to want to adjust the ruler up or down so that it lines up perfectly with the bottom of the spring. That means that with no mass on the end of the spring, in other words, no force on the end of the spring, there is no displacement. Okay? A force of zero, a displacement of zero. Then what you're going to do is hook masses onto here. You saw that tray right here. You're going to put masses onto the tray, hook the tray onto the spring, and then you're going to find that because there's mass on the spring, a force of gravity acting down on the spring, the spring's going to stretch. Okay? That's effectively what you're going to measure, the force of gravity that you apply on it and how the displacement of that spring responds to that force of gravity that's being applied on the spring. So it's going to look something like this. Right now, I see the bottom of the spring is lined up with three centimeters. Okay, we would record whatever mass we put onto this tray, and we would record the displacement of the spring as a result of that mass or that force that we're adding to this spring. Your data table is going to look something like this. you got a mass that you've added to this tray. You can record that in grams or kilograms. I don't really care. Just make sure you specify what units you're recording it in. And you've got a displacement, which is X, not delta D displacement, but it's X displacement, right? The amount of stretching of the spring. One set of data. Then what do you do? Well, you repeat it. You repeat it with more mass. What's the displacement that responds to that? Can you change the mass again? How much does the displacement change? What you're really doing here, right, is not changing the mass. You're changing the force, the applied force. But you're doing it by changing the mass. So repeat that 10 times, at least 10 times. And of course, 10 different displacements that result from those 10 different forces that we're applying on it. You've got to have an analysis table as well. And that analysis table 
is going to look something like this, where you have a force. One is mass and displacement. Now it's force and displacement. But you guys know how to find force, right? It's a hanging mass. So to find the force here, it's simply going to be the mass. If it's in grams, you're going to convert it to kilograms. Mass divided by 1,000. If it's already in kilograms, then just multiply it by 9.81. I don't care what units your data table is in, but your analysis table needs to be in newtons and in meters. If you were in centimeters before, that's fine. Make it meters now. If you were in grams before, that's fine. Convert it to kilograms now and, uh, and then multiply it by 9.81. You need to be in newtons and you need to be in meters now. Why? Because you're going to plot a graph of the y versus x or of displacement versus the force. And that graph is going to give you a, a good straight line. Okay, when you collect data for this, it will be probably the best straight line of any activity you've done this year. The data that we get for this, if you're, if you're paying attention, is really, really good. Okay, it's almost perfect, in fact. It should be a very good straight line that intersects either with the origin or really, really close to the origin. Now, I could tell you, I could simply tell you how to get the spring constant from this graph. And in the end, I will tell you how to get the spring constant from the graph. But I'm going to show you a little technique for the first time that you're going to use in Physics 30 quite a lot. You won't have to use this technique on an exam this year, but you will next year. So follow along with me, get a taste of it, so that next year um, it's a little bit of review for you. So that next year it's, hey, I remember that from Physics 20. I don't remember exactly how to do it, but I remember little bits and pieces of it from Physics 20. Here's what you want to do whenever you have a straight line graph. First of all, you want to write down an equation from the graph. Who can tell me what the equation is that describes any straight line graph? I don't care if it's displacement versus force or position versus time. What equation describes any straight line graph? Good. Y is, y, y is equal to mx plus b. You're going to do that so many times next year in Physics 30, it's not even funny. Okay, every time you have a straight line graph, even if it's a graph you've never seen before. And guess what, guys? That's going to happen, by the way. Okay, in a month and a day, 32 days from now, my physics third are going to have a diploma exam. There will be a graphing question on that exam, and there's about a 75% chance they will have never seen that graph before. My job in physics 30 is not to teach you about this graph. My job in physics 30 is to teach you how to deal with any graph, whether you've seen it before or not. Okay? So, they're going to, for I promise you, for that graph on that diploma exam on June 27th, they're going to start this way. They're going to say it's a straight line, so y equals mx plus b. And then they're going to replace y with whatever appears on the y-axis. What appears on the y-axis of that graph? Yeah, it, yeah which is kind of odd, right? It's, it's the displacement that appears on the y-axis, but that displacement is x. Not x as in the x-axis, but x as in the displacement. Does that make sense? What does m stand for? What does m stand for in that equation? Good. I'm going to write out the word slope here. The reason I am going to write it out instead of just putting in an m is because, look, it's already confusing by putting x in for y. I don't want to get confused and think this is a mass. What's x? What's on my x-axis? Force. It's not little f, it's big F, because a little f would be frequency, right? What does b stand for? The y-intercept. You're going to find that the y-intercept here is either 0 or so close to 0 that it's not going to matter. So we're going to just get rid of the y-intercept. That won't always happen next year in Physics 30, but for this one it does, and it often does. All right, there we go. We got an equation that describes this graph. Uh, X displacement is equal to the slope times the force. Now what we got to do is get an equation from our data sheet that has the same variables 
is this equation that I just got from my graph. Can you tell me what equation for my data sheet has both x as in displacement x and f in it? If you can't think of it right now, that's okay. Look at your data sheet. What has f and x in it? Good, Oliver. F is equal to kx. Now, Oliver actually said negative kx because he was talking about the restoring force, right? We're actually talking about the applied force here, so we're going to drop the negative, but that's okay. If you put negative, it wouldn't be the end of the world there. Yep. So I still don't understand why we Well, okay, let's go back to this then if you don't understand that. Um, we're using x for y not because this x down here represents the x-axis, but because dis the symbol for displacement is x. We're talking about the amount that a spring is stretched. Remember, 1 half kx squared, f times x. The symbol for displacement is x. So it has nothing to do with the x-axis. I wish the first one of these that you see was not confusing like that, but it is, right? Just understand that this could be any other symbol. It's just that it's, it's not. It's the symbol for displacement is x, unfortunately. All right, so there's my equation for my data sheet that Ollie correctly identified. Now what I want to do is rearrange that to solve for the same variable. Okay, in this equation for the graph, I had x is equal to slope over f. Let's rearrange this, and we get x is equal to f over k. So there we go. We got an equation for my graph that says x is equal to something. We got an equation for my data sheet that says x is equal to something. Now, we've done the hard part. All I want to do now is cross off x because it appears in both. Cross off f because it appears in both. And now circle the slope because it's all that I have left. Circle 1 over k. See 1 over k there? Because I, I canceled it with the f, right? Slope of my graph equals 1 over k. If I want to find the spring constant, then let's say k is equal to 1 over the slope. Google Sheets will spit out the slope value for me. All I have to do is flip that over, take the inverse of that, and I got my spring constant. Does that make sense? It's not actually that hard, is it, to do that analysis? Through grade 10 and grade 11, even, even earlier this year, okay, me, I told you this, right? When, when you've seen graphs, your teacher has told you what the slope means. Now, for the first time, you actually have a way of figuring out what the slope means for any graph, whether you've seen it before or not. Aiden? Well, we're not actually canceling. I, notice I didn't, I didn't use the term cancel. I used the term cross off. Okay, we're not canceling because it's not one equation. We're not, they're not equal to each other. Well, they are actually equal to each other, but we, we haven't set them equal to each other. I'm just arbitrarily crossing off the variables that appear in both because it works, okay? Now, what you could do, I suppose, is set them equal to each other, and then you would find that it was actually a process of canceling at that point. But if you set them equal to each other, then the, then the x would just disappear when you set them equal to each other, right? It would be slope times f is equal to f over k, and then just cross off the f's. Does that make some sense? Okay. There you go. So now we know how to find the value of k. Um, you're going to do that for your lab. That's the purpose of this lab, right, is to find the value of k. Now, I want you, when you're doing the analysis of this, for this lab, to show me this work. I've done it for you, so why, you know, you're thinking all I'm going to do is copy it over. Yeah, you know what, probably. All you're going to do is probably copy it over. But just copying it over is something, right? We internalize it even just a little bit, even just by copying it over. So I want you to um, hopefully think about it as you're copying it, but even if you're not, okay, copying it over is going to help a little bit. Then once you insert this into your lab, okay, give me the value of k, and then move forward to the conclusion. By the way, you don't have to actually type this out if, it's, if you have a tough time with typing and superscripts and rearranging equations and, and so on using, using a document, using a, a word processor. It's fine to write that up by hand, snap a picture, and then just insert it into your document. That's fine. Okay, what comes next? Look, we just found the spring constant, so 
Right. We've got to conclude something. Your conclusion is going to be based on your problem, since we don't have hypothesis. Basically, what's the value of the spring constant, and how do you know? And then you want to have some good sources of air, and then suggestions for improvement. Don't just say, oh, this, this could have been better. This could have been better. How could it have been better? And be specific. Okay, don't just say, like, uh, oh, I, you know, the apparatus wasn't very good. I should have had a better apparatus. Well, what do you mean? What could have been better about the apparatus? Okay, if, you, if there's a problem with the materials, all right, that's fine. Fair enough. Tell me what it is, though. Okay, tell me how it could have been better, not just, oh, I should have got a better apparatus, a more precise apparatus. All right. What do you got to hand, what do you got to hand in for this one? You got a problem? Hey, we all have problems, right? Um, you got a problem, but you're going to solve that problem here today. You got a problem, you got variable, variables, I should say. We got materials. You don't need to worry about hypothesis. You do not need to worry about procedure here. You've got data. You've got analysis. You've got conclusion. And you've got sources of error. Now, this lab is going to be due on Monday. Usually I give you three days to do it. Today I'm only giving you two, two school days, that is, to do it for two reasons. One, because you will have a fair bit of time in class today to work on this. Uh, when you finish collecting data, the data goes fairly quickly for this. And secondly, uh, we don't want to make it due on Tuesday because that means people are going to leave it till Tuesday and we're on our field trip on Tuesday. You're going to get back at 9 o'clock and, oh, I better do that lab because it's due in three hours. It's due on, this is due on Monday. I don't care when on Monday for this one, even if it's after school, but it's due on Monday, not Tuesday. All right? 